Yeah. And we're out of storage. We have, sh we have piles of wood there. We're not doing it. We don't want to do it. It's time for everybody's favorite rambly, long-winded videos on the Homesteady channel. Ask Homesteady. We have a great Q&A for you today. We have a lot of really good questions. Like, do I recommend homesteading if you're single? Can you homestead without any income, any money coming in? Just provide all your needs from your homestead? And the question everybody wants to know, what is that thing on my hat? We're gonna get to all that and more in today's episode of Ask Homesteady. Let's jump in. If you would like to get a question answered on this weekly piece that we do, Ask Homesteady, it's very simple. All you have to do is when you ask your question on any of our videos, leave the hashtag and then Ask Homesteady one word. Ask Home Study so that when I sit down to do the Ask Home Study segment, I can find the questions. If you ask a question on our videos, but you haven't put Ask Home Study, I probably won't find them when I sit down to do this part and I won't get to answer your question. So make sure to put one word, hashtag Ask Home Study, and you regular viewers out there, thank you so much. I've noticed you've been adding the Ask Home Study uh, to other people's questions who don't know. I really appreciate that. Let's get into all the questions we have today. We have so many questions to answer. Let's dive in. The first question for today is from Lori. She says, I am trying to decide if it is better to continue feeding my chickens all organic feed or if a local non-GMO feed at significant cost savings is an okay way to go. I wanna be as natural as possible, but see the future costs being significantly higher when we bring in large farm animals, dairy, cows, and pigs. Any advice on making this choice would be so appreciated. Thanks, Ask Homesteady. Lori, awesome question to start this week off with. Back at Squash Hollow Farm, our old homestead, we did exactly what you're talking about. We purchased local non-GMO feed from a farmer whose farm we could go, this was a, a feed farm, they had a feed, they grew the plants, they had the feed mill, they ground everything up, they mixed it all on site. If you're interested in that feed, it, they actually ship it all over the country. Uh, that feed is stone, I better check this, hold on. Stone House Grain. Uh, they're in Hudson, New York, but they ship their feed all over the place. They do a GMO-free, really high-quality feed, and you can get it shipped to your farm if you're looking for a good source. They are super reasonable. The pricing on that feed is way better than what you would find for an organic feed at like, you know, a tractor supply. And if a bunch of you go and email Ben at Stone House Grain or Emily, Tell them you heard about them on Homesteady because I would love to get them to sponsor this show because I love their product and I would talk about them every day. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, let them know you heard about them on Homesteady. That said, if you're looking for a good quality feed just because it has an organic stamp doesn't mean it's what you want to be feeding your animals. Large scale organic production in my opinion is not always better than small scale local non-organic production. What I produced at Squash Hollow Farm was not organic. I couldn't have that organic stamp, but I would eat that any day over an organic. The pork that I would raise at Squash Hollow Farm was a much better quality pork than what you would buy from like a Whole Foods stamped organic. And I feel that applies to feed as well. If you can find a local source where you can go and look the farmer in the eye and ask him, you know, what do you do with pesticides? What do you do with herbicides? Uh, what's your rotation? When do you spray? What do you do for pests? How do you treat the land? Ask those questions. The farmer looks you in the eye and gives you the answers you want to hear. Buy from him. I don't care that it doesn't have an organic stamp and neither should you. The local food movement is all about knowing your farmer and knowing your feed and your food and its sources. So don't let that organic be the end all, 100% what matters answer to your questions. I would still prefer to buy meat that was not stamped organic at like a Whole Foods, even if I knew my local farmer was giving them 
non-organic, not and non-GMO, what's the word here? Not organic and not GMO free feed. If I saw that those animals were pastured, that they had a nice life, they were getting good supplements, I personally personally value the local product that you can go and see more than any stamp. And Lori, I hope that helps you make your decision, especially if it will help you save money. We are very much fans of bringing the cost down on the homestead. Homesteading can be very costly, which we'll get to some questions today that deal with this topic. And I think it is better for everybody involved to find a good quality source, not let perfect be the enemy of the good here. Uh, be reasonable, find a good local farmer to support. And if you're happy with the way they manage if their feed and what they're providing for you, yeah, forget the organic stamp and buy from a local. Ryan wants to know how many acres do we have available of pasture land for the cows? Ryan, more than we can use. <laughs> the backfield behind me is like 400 yards long and about 300 wide, it's enormous. Uh, we will not be using even half of that for what we're doing right now. So we have plenty of space here and we're blessed with that. And that's only one of the fields. The one up top, there's a whole nother field up top which we haven't shown you yet. Cray Hack watched our video on butchering roosters and asked, why don't you keep the organs and head and stuff for the dogs? Cray Hack, good question. Happy to answer this one. A lot of people think, oh, you should save all your organs for your dogs, feed it to your dogs. I don't like feeding my dogs big, like the heads or the feet, stuff that could get stuck in their throat, mess up their intestinal system. My dog is a finely tuned machine and you throw something weird at him and he'll get the runs. That's your best case scenario. Worst case scenario, he could get something lodged in an intestine and it could wind up with a big, heavy, huge vet bill or even worse. When it comes to feeding animals, I don't like using like scrap or garbage or leftovers or bad things for feeding expensive, important animals. If it's weird and sloppy kind of refuse e food things, the chickens get it. Because at the end of the day, I feed chicken slop. If one chicken chokes on something weird, it's not a huge loss. But if my dog were to get, you know, damaged from eating a chicken head, yeah, that's not worth any savings or any nutritional benefit you would get from feeding your dog a chicken head. So not into that. Now before you get all mad, like, oh, you should use everything, the Native Americans used every piece of the animal, hold the phone. There are other ways to use the leftover livers, guts, heads, feet from your chickens that I would do. Uh, the most basic, easy way to take care of stuff like that, if you have a really major, huge, hot compost pile that you turn with a machine, you can throw it all in the compost pile and it'll turn into some really high quality nitrogen for your plants. We used to do that at Squash Hollow Farm. We don't yet have a giant compost pile here on this homestead. That'll be on the to-do list eventually. So with our last chicken butcher, what happened to all the guts and feet and heads? They got thrown out. We just threw them away and I don't feel bad for that and you shouldn't either if you've just moved on to a new homestead if you're just getting your feet under you you can't do everything at once running a compost pile is another farm chore that needs done and you only have so much time in the day we are spending lots of our time still unpacking you've seen in our videos recently we're still digging through boxes and things I just don't have time to get the compost pile going so it's okay once in a while if you butcher some chickens not to use the chicken's head because you used the rest of the chicken and it had a great life and whatever you would get from trying to use up the head, it's just, there's, there's bigger, more important problems that we all have to deal with than chasing the chicken head. Rock's Corner wants to know why when we milk, we milk, we have a bucket with some cheesecloth over it with a rubber band, Kay milks through the cloth and then that milk goes into the bucket. Why do we then strain it when we get inside? Wouldn't it save time just putting it through the cheesecloth or even into the strainer, into the bucket? Good question, Rox. So when you're milking your cow, 
you're milking her in the barn and then you're carrying that bucket from the barn into your house we like to have as many pieces in between us and our milk to keep that milk as clean as possible when you're drinking raw milk for your family you can get very sick from raw milk that is a fact you want to take precautions and make sure that your raw milk is clean and pure and so good so you can give it to your family and not worry. We milk in the barn, we milk through that cheesecloth, it keeps a lot of the debris out. But as you then walk up into the house and even pull that cheesecloth off of the pail, stuff can fall back into that bucket. And then pouring it through a strainer directly into a ball jar and then on with the lid, that is the best way to filter it at this kind of small scale homestead level without any expensive equipment. So it's just a safety issue, keeping our milk as clean as possible. The less debris that gets in the milk, the less microorganisms swimming around in that milk, producing toxins that then over time can multiply and eventually get to a low level that would make you or your family members sick. I love raw milk, but I'm not a raw milk fanatic who thinks it's God's gift to humankind and can never do anything bad. Raw milk can make you sick just like all the other food that we produce here on the homestead and you have to be smart and take as many precautions as is reasonable without also living your life constantly in fear of getting sick. So it's a balance thing but I think with the raw milk it's worth having as many steps in between you and feeding your family uh, to keep the milk safe. Jordan Stone wants to know, is the UTV that he sees us driving around gas, electric, or diesel? Jordan, the UTV, we have two on this property. There is a two-person Gator, John Deere, and there is a six-person, I forget what the other one is, but they are both diesel, and yeah, they're fun. It's nice to have those to work the property with. They're a lot of fun. And now the question you've all been asking. I'm getting this question or comment so often. Aust, are you trying to start a new fashion trend? Is that a tag still on your hat? You know, you gotta keep that fresh, clean tag on your nice crisp. No. It is a fishing license. Here in Pennsylvania, when you go fishing, you have to have your fishing license visible so the game warden going by can just at a quick glance see that you are a law-abiding citizen with your fishing license and that is your first step to making sure that you don't get bothered by a game warden while fishing because nobody likes that so no this is not the tag that my hat came with this is my fishing license I printed it out I laminated it I threw it on my hat whenever I go fishing I take my hat so I always have my license and it's always visible and I don't even need to think about it it's just there and it's ready to go just one less thing to worry about every day especially when you go fishing you don't want to be worrying about stuff you want to be catching sweet bass and crappy and having a nice time outside Teresa Baker watched the video where we were cleaning our barn. She said it looks great. Love the first song in the video. Could you include the artist info in your videos? I do get asked from time to time, who was that playing that song or where can I find that song? I get all my music through companies that produce music for YouTubers and content creators. This music is not available on iTunes. You can't pay a dollar and get the song. You have to spend money on a yearly subscription. So every year I spend a couple hundred dollars on my different subscriptions for music that we put in our videos. Which is one reason that we mention if you love Homestead and you want us to help, if you want to help us keep doing it, you can become a Homesteady Pioneer. You can click up there to become one. It's five bucks a month. And that five bucks a month goes towards things like the camera gear, the computer, and the music. If you like having the music in the videos, I have to pay for all that music. And it's a regular, every month I put money out to these different companies. And I use three different companies because I want a really good selection of music. I don't want to play the same two songs all the time, get sick of them. So that's one of the expenses. And if you love what we do and you want to help support us, become a Homesteady Pioneer. Five bucks a month, you get bonus content. You get homesteading master classes. We just put the full length stanchion video in there uh, for homesteading pioneers to see the extended version. So a lot of stuff like that. You can click that and learn more. 
and uh, unfortunately I can't list where you can find any of the music unless you wanted to spend a monthly fee to listen to YouTube music. So sorry about that, but it's nice music. Just rewatch our videos a bunch of times and you can enjoy the music. <laughs> I know, it's a bad answer. Matt House has two questions. One of them is on whether or not we have children that would have diagnosed conditions that the public school would consider special needs or 504 or IEP eligible. And would that influence our decision to homeschool if we did? So that's a good question, Matt House. Get to that one first. I have never looked into whether any of my children have special needs. I can tell you right off the bat, my children, uh, none of them have any, um, any issues that are glaring that we would look into this sort of thing, any special needs issues. Whether or not they would run into problems in public school, one of the reasons we decided to homeschool was because my oldest son is a young boy who is full of energy. And I was worried because going through public school, I saw a lot of kids full of energy who got branded with the ADD stamp. I'm not saying ADD is not real. I'm not saying ADHD isn't real or that if you have a child who's dealing with that issue, it's not. It's just, a you know, your kid has a lot of energy. But what I do believe is that too many kids get labeled ADD or ADHD because they're young kids who want to run and play and don't want to sit in a school for six hours a day. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to sit down for six hours a day. So for that reason, we decided to homeschool and I can't really answer your question as to whether or not having a child with special needs would change that decision. What I could say is that we would obviously get some professional help if we were dealing with an issue that we felt we could not handle on our own. Um, but we don't have any special needs that we've noticed. There's no obvious issues that we've needed to look into. And so I would be, uh, you learn when you have kids that if you don't have that issue, then you don't really know. Because when you have kids and people who don't have kids give you advice, you don't listen to them because they don't have kids. So if you don't have special needs kids, if I told you what I would do, I would just be making stuff up. So I'm not gonna make anything up. And just gonna say we would probably get whatever help we felt we needed. Second question Matt House asked was, now that we are near family here, uh, will we find ourselves with the children less? What will we do for spouse quality time? Oh, I wouldn't say we will find ourselves with children less. Uh, we always have, uh, we have four kids, so we always have somebody. Speaking of spouse quality time, that was, oh, no. this is that question is about, about spouse quality time. Uh -oh. Me and my backwards hat. What would we... Why is your hat backwards? Because I was showing off my tag and what uh. it was. And I was trying to be super cool. Did it. My backwards hat. Fail miserably. So what would we do? What would we change first if we could do so in regards to spouse quality time? I, we like spouse quality time. We like taking a little time for ourselves. Often we do that in the morning before the children are awake. We have our coffee time and the children are not allowed to interrupt coffee time with things they want, things they need, period, really, unless somebody's bleeding profusely. <laughs> what would you change about spouse uh, quality time? That, that one doesn't work, guys. We gotta use the one from in the barn. Would you want it? Would you want more quality time with me? No. 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 We like being with our kids. We spend a lot of time oh, like together one as a on family. One, like without the kids. Yeah. What would we would we do more? I'll pause it so you can think. Kay likes to think before she speaks. Who I'm not does like that? that. Here, let's go put the hose to the water. Oh, I didn't pause it. Spouse quality time is very important. We make sure every day we get time together uninterrupted. But we also like to be with our kids doing fun things and activities together. So I can't say that we would change a whole lot. We just like to make sure we get our quiet time in the morning. Why would you do that? Now I have to edit. I'm not gonna remember, I don't edit these videos. Oh. I don't think we would change much. Mafford, Ma, Ma, Ma Fowd, I'm sorry, I did not get that name right. Ma, Ma Foud asks, sorry, I didn't get your name right. Are we planning to rebreed Ladybug before her milk dries up? Yep, we definitely are. She's still in milk right now and we will be breeding her 
hopefully next month because that's the time. Now's the time. We got to breed her. Okay, I'm going to lose that now. Teresa asks, have you always had cows? What level of difficulty would you say raising them is? Great question. We have not always had cows. Both of us, Ladybug is the first cow experience that we have had. Cows are incredibly, I shouldn't say cows, we own two cows right now. The cows that we have have been awesome animals. The learning curve on the cows has not been any worse than any other larger livestock on the homestead. I would go so far as to say that cows are much easier animals to work with when compared to other larger livestock on the homestead. For example, when it comes to fencing, cows, our cows are very, very respectful of electric fence. Now that's different than maybe a big herd of beef cattle, but if you just have one homestead cow for milk versus one or two homestead cows versus like two homestead goats, cows are gonna be much less work for much better product. So if you're thinking about going the route of large animals for milk on the homestead, I don't think you need to do goats first unless you're unsure of how serious you are. If you're definitely going to do milk and you're 100% in and you just want to know which animal is better to start with, don't bother with goats. Go with the cow. It's so much easier. The fencing back there. I, we put that up in a day. There's two strands. They don't touch it. If they get out, they come when they're called. It, they're, they're very, very easy. Now, let me make sure to put this in here. Although they are easy, I wouldn't say they're a difficult animal to raise or work with. They are a very large animal. So if you have no experience with large animals, well then you might be better off getting a smaller, smaller large animal like a goat to get some experience. Kay grew up with horses. She grew up with goats. She had a lot of large animal experience. So working with a cow was not scary or new to her. It was to me, but I wasn't the one handling the cow every day. And since working with the cow, I've gotten much more used to being around them and trusting them and working with them. So yeah, I love cows. And um, I'm really glad we got cows on our homestead. And as you listen to the goat back there yelling at me this entire video, you'll know why that's the case. Kristen wanted to know, whose guineas are those? Didn't we leave ours back in Connecticut? We sure did. These guineas are the ones that Kay's mom has been raising and has here every year. She does a huge batch of guineas to take care of the tick problem. And we were very happy to move onto a property loaded up with guineas. It was a nice size flock. And hopefully we'll have uh, hatch some more out and keep growing. Every year we got to do more because you lose guineas. Guineas get hammered by predators, but they are awesome for tick control. Speaking of tick control and fleas as well, Beverly wanted to know, do goats and cows get tick and fleas? If so, what do you put on them to get rid of them? We have seen ticks on the cows and the goats. Uh, we've heard that goats actually will pull a tick right off of each other. They'll bite each other and pull the ticks right off. So that's neat. I've never seen it happen, uh, but Kay's aunt told us that happens and she's got like a million goats. So that's neat. I've, we've never experienced fleas, but we do in the springtime goats will get mites that have them itchy and kind of they, they shake and quiver and it drives them nuts. What do we do to get rid of them? What do we put on them? The cows get a fly spray, which we're going to be talking about fly spray more in upcoming videos, but we do put a fly spray, which is also a tick repellent too. The goats don't get that as much because they don't get hammered as much by the flies and the mites. Usually it's just a, an issue where in the springtime they get these mites because they've been inside and they just got to get outside and take a few dust baths and that kind of gets rid of them. So it's one of those things you let time take care of. Never have had fleas on either. Comment below if you've ever experienced fleas on either of those animals. Juniper Farms why don't y'all incubate and sell chicks? We enjoy watching them hatch. We, from very rare time to time, will incubate chicks. If you look back far enough on this channel, you might find some videos of chicks incubating. 
Generally, we don't like to incubate because it's so much more work than letting a broody hen or a broody, what do you call the little ones? Um, bantam, a broody bantam or a broody hen hatch them. Right now, we just had ducklings being hatched by our duck. When you incubate, you gotta worry about humidity and make sure the machine is rolling the eggs and you gotta pay attention to so many variables and things can go wrong. One year we were incubating and we had like, the entire time we were incubating these guinea eggs, we had like six power outages. That's so much extra stuff to worry about on the homestead where a chicken will just put them under her and take care of her and if the power goes out, She's still there producing heat, and when the chicks start to hatch, she'll roll the eggs around, and everything works so much easier the way it's supposed to, so we just don't like to be bothered with incubating. However, we will usually once a year do it because it's fun for the kids to watch it in the incubator, watch everything hatch. So we will from time to time, but for the most part, we like to let, let the hens do what they're good at, and broody hens like to do it. Uh, Bo, what's your ethnical background, dude? Just curious. You look a bit Iranian or SMG. My ethnical background, on the one side, I'm a lot of Spanish stuff, Colombian, Puerto Rican. On the other side, I got a lot of Italian and also some kind of weird random stuff, like a little bit of Irish, a little bit of French Canadian, eh? So uh, kind of like a smorgasbord. Virginia and Waylon ask, will you be putting your children in 4-H? We've heard a lot of great things about 4-H, something we'll have to look into, learn more about. We like going to the fairs every year, so I'm sure we could find out there's a really big fair near where we live in Pennsylvania here that we're very excited to go to this year. So we'll have to look into 4-H a bit more. Kathy asks a fantastic question. Would you recommend a single person to start homesteading? I like the question in the way she asked it, would you recommend? So not like is it can you or can't you? And would you recommend that they start homesteading? So Kathy, absolutely. I don't think being single means you can't homestead. However, it may help you decide what you should or should not do on the homestead based off what may or may not go wrong, where you live, other things to consider. If you're a single person who's all alone, you don't have any friends or family and you live in Alaska on like 100 acres, I probably wouldn't get a lot of big animals because things can go wrong if you get sick and that sort of thing. It could be, there could be a lot of problems. However, you could automate a lot of systems so that when you got sick or just needed a day off, things would be taken care of and you could keep tabs on everything. One of the beautiful things about homesteading in our modern day is you can very inexpensively have automatic water, a feed set up for a week at a time, you can have cameras on your animals, temperature monitors, you can pay attention to everything from an iPad while you're sick in bed and make sure, okay, the animals look good, I got a couple more days, and if I really get in a jam, I can call that neighbor who's a couple hours away and on Saturday he can come help me out. So you just have to make sure to plan for things to go wrong. If you're homesteading and you're single, don't be operating at your maximum capacity when things are going good. Plan to operate at the maximum capacity one person could handle when they're sick for like three or four days. What would be a good, what would be good things to do on your homestead if you're single? What would we suggest based off our experience? Obviously you can start with growing things. Plants, if you get sick for a week and you can't do anything, you get injured, the worst case is your plants will bolt or wither and die and just turn into more nitrogen for the soil for next year. So by all means, get involved with growing plants. That's a pretty safe one. Maybe not as exciting as the big mammals, but you could do aquaponics if you like working with fish. Worst case scenario, if something happens and you get sick or you gotta stop doing homesteading for a while, you either eat your fish or you take them to a lake and set them free. So there's another option. And you can do the plants and the fish all together in a pretty good closed loop system. 
The smaller homesteading animals are great. Chickens, uh, rabbits, quail, something that you could take care of easily if you wind up getting sick. I always go back to getting sick because that's the idea. If you're a single person and suddenly you can't take care of your animals, there's no one else there to take care of your animals if you live alone on you know 50 acres in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, the smaller animals, you can fill up a big feeder, you can put automate, automated waterers on them, and for three or four days, hardly check on them and nothing really bad will happen as long as their food and their water is okay and their temperature. The bigger animals are where you get into trouble. When it comes to larger livestock on the homestead, I also think a single person could handle larger livestock if you had the right land situation, the right work, life, homestead balance, and a good backup plan. If you don't live in the middle of nowhere and you have a farmer that you buy hay from or a friend that you know who had experience uh, milking cows, these are both things that we had back in Connecticut and here in Pennsylvania. We have people we know that if we got into a jam could help us out with the cow or could help us out just for a couple days if we needed a little bit of help. So if you have the right work-life balance and you can handle a larger animal and you got that backup where if something really bad happened for a week at a time, you could have an emergency, you know, a buddy come and help you out for a little bit, then yeah, go for it. But make sure to build systems that make your life easier. Uh, for example, we have Ladybug and Luna. We're calf sharing. We get less milk and less cream because of that. But the benefit is for the last two months, we had been, been milking our cow. Luna's been keeping up on her, taking care of all the milking. If you did something like that, it would be very easy as a single person to have a dairy cow. If you don't have calf sharing, you don't have a good backup plan, and you get really knocked down sick for a week, and you got a dairy animal, that's not a good situation. So just everyone's life's different. Would I recommend homesteading to a single person? Absolutely, but make sure the, the biggest, most important thing to remember is don't operate at maximum capacity. Instead, operate at you know half or a third capacity, and that way when things go wrong, and that you it become maximum capacity, it's not total chaos and things don't blow up and things don't die. Just be reasonable, pick a couple things you like to do and focus on those, and resist the urge to do more and more and more. That's not bad advice for all of us, including single people. Are you single and homesteading? Leave a comment below. Tell us how you do it. Tell us what you do, what animals, what things on the farm that you enjoy and give any advice because I'm not single and homesteading and I never have been. So we'd like to hear advice from you. And now we're going to take a quick break. We're gonna put a commercial right here in the middle. It helps us do these longer videos. We'll be back right after this commercial. And now we're back from the commercial. We're gonna get into the next question, which is, Maria asked, what is the countertop in the kitchen barn apartment made of? It looks wonderful. We think it's for mica. It's not like stone. It looks like marble, but it's not. It's like a printed version. And yeah, it's really nice. And much cheaper than doing any of those expensive stones. Brenda wants to know, what are we likely to change at the big house when we move over there sooner or later to better suit your family's needs and pleasures? Good question, Brenda. Right away, we're gonna do some painting, just kind of personalize it, change the colors up a bit, make it more like us, put some of our art on the walls, just kind of reface it. As far as anything structural goes, we're not planning on changing anything structural anytime soon. We've had enough structural putting this place in, so nothing there. Room use wise, a lot of that's gonna stay the same as what Kay grew up with. There'll be the boys' room, the girls' room, they will share the bedrooms, we'll have our bedroom, the office will stay the office, the, you know, playroom's gonna be the playroom. Pretty much everything will stay very similar. The only thing we might do is uh, maybe I don't know, not a whole lot. Maybe have a dining room table, maybe put something in the basement for like workshop video something. But we're, we're so tired from doing all this, I think we're just gonna move in and go, uh. Kendra's laughing at me. 
She's laughing not with me, she's laughing at me. Sime Co asks another one of those questions that we get asked all the time. It's a really good one, and I'm gonna read lots of what he's asking here to make sure I get it right. Uh, so he wants to leave the corporate life behind. My wife is fed up with corporate life. I was fed up long ago. Through her grace and generosity, I've been able to pursue a lot of personal ambitions. Your wife sounds like my wife. We're both wanting an independent life where family and our children are our focus. What does that look like for them? Timber frame, hand-built home, and outbuildings. Most like 80% of our food from our own land, water from rain catchment, solar, wood, gas-powered electric system. Whew, I'm tired of just reading that. When it comes to what you may have a lot of knowledge on, animals, when we are independent, we need everything on the homestead for, to pay for itself. So, milk cows, the milk and the meat needs to be not costing more than what we could purchase it for. Chickens and eggs, not costing more than what we could purchase it for. Goats, milk, meat, not costing more than what we could purchase it for. Pigs, not costing more than what we could cost purchase it for. The only animal that they don't expect to pay for itself would be their draft horses, but they will be used for hauling both carts and pulling logs. So the big question he wants to know, is it possible to have a self-funded homestead without outside income? I feel like I'm about to lose a subscriber here. Time code, you might not love the answer, but being Involved with homesteading for the last seven years now, what my first thought reading this is like, whoa, take it easy. Let's take this one part at a time. The things that you want to do, all of them are tons of work. So building the timber frame home by hand and outbuildings and the energy and the water rain catchment. You can find entire channels focused on just that one one of those things. You're asking us about the animals. So let's zero right in onto the animals and our experience. Your hope is to get 80% of your food from the land. I'm assuming you mean both animals and vegetables. I can promise you right now, you will by no means be able to produce milk, meat, eggs, any of those things cheaper than what you can buy it at the store. Now let me put some specifics to this. You didn't mention what store or what quality food you like to buy. If you want to get eggs as cheap as possible, go and buy them at the supermarket for like a dollar a dozen or two dollars a dozen. There is no way you can do them on your own homestead cheaper than that. The amount of feed those companies producing those eggs buy, get their feed way, way low price. They don't need to make a lot of money on the eggs because they sell just tons and tons of them. A lot of those companies are subsidized. The point is, when you start raising your own food, you're gonna realize real quick, I'm not saving any money. I'm spending more money. Now, someone in the comments below is gonna say, I produce chickens cheaper than what are at the supermarket. I live down south and I have in the back of my yard a giant corn field and they go out and they eat all the corn they want. I don't buy feed ever and they live in a building that was already there and sure, maybe you can do, maybe one random or a couple random people could do chickens cheaper. But now let's talk about the meat animals. Meat animals need a lot of protein to produce that meat. If you raise pigs, you cannot just put them out on grass and expect them to become a big, meaty, yummy pig. You gotta have protein feed. You're gonna go through one pig, one full grown pig in one year, sow, that is then gonna have your next pigs because you're gonna to have to be breeding your own because you're not getting an income to pay money for other people to do this. Um, that sow is gonna go through a ton, one ton of processed feed. That means you have to grow more than a ton and then grind that up and mix it together and then give that to the pig. Maybe you're gonna get a heritage breed that's better at rooting for bugs and acorns, sure, but you still need to get it some feed. 
and that feed to plant the amount of land that you need to grow that kind of feed and then the machines you will need to produce. This is so unlikely that anyone these in our modern time can just homestead without an income. Because in addition to your food needs, you, you still need to think about your power needs, which you, you want to produce your own too. Um, but you need to think about you know, transportation. What happens when you got to take somebody to the hospital? Do you have a car? You're not generating your own gas. So where are you getting your gas from? You need some sort of income. So can you be totally self-sufficient, live off the land, and not need any money at all? In this day and age, without being living like a total crazy hermit, no. And they didn't even do that back in homestead times. If you read about homesteaders back in the 1800s, they didn't produce all their food. They didn't produce all their stuff. They picked one or two good things and they hammered on that. Maybe they grew a, a wheat crop and they got a nice big wheat crop and then they harvested all that and they took their excess to the local guy who had the little store with all the other stuff they needed like sugar which you can't grow here in North America and they said I need sugar and sugar was incredibly expensive back then not like today so they were like I got bushels and bushels and bushels of wheat and they said okay here's a little bowl of sugar so they would barter and trade and that's essentially just what we're doing today with money is we're taking our money and we're exchanging things. So do I think that you and your wife can go and live 100% off the land with no outside help? No. Right now I am producing what I think is around 40% of my family's food. That I get from the, the fact that we produce all our meat through farming, hunting, or trading what we've raised for other things. So that's on my plate, 40% of what I'm eating is meat and I do all that myself and milk. We have our milk coming in and that's a lot of our diet. So 40% meat and milk. Doing 40% of just food is a ton of work and we are not producing the food for our food. We're buying all the grain, we're buying all the feeds, we're buying all the inputs. It would take so much work to do what you're talking about. I, I don't think out of a million people, I don't think there's 10 who could do what you're talking about, Sam Co. And it's not because I don't think you have what it takes. Uh, it's just there's so much there. And the life that we're all used to now, even if we were willing to give it up, we now live in an area where there's lots of Mennonites who are living a lot like this. Mennonites, they are not using electricity, they're not using power. They live in communities. And as a community, they're all doing this. But you, your wife, and a couple kids, that's not enough community to do this. If you went to a community of people where one guy could do the corn and another guy could do the beets and another the wheat and somebody could have the horses and somebody could do the livestock and one guy could run the corner store that then trades and a whole community could do this and that's what the homesteaders did. They set up communities out west. They didn't care where you were from. You could back then you could be black, you could be white, you could be Asian, it didn't matter. They formed a community because they needed that because they couldn't do it all themselves. And those people were way more hardcore than most of us today. And I don't know you personally, Sam Co, but if, if those people back then needed the community to do it, I think all of us do too. And that's something I think that gets so overlooked in this self-sufficient and a self-reliant world, do it yourself, grow from the land. People forget about the community element. And that is such an important piece of this whole homesteading world. If you're going to be more self-sufficient or more self-reliant, you learn very quickly that that self-sufficiency and reliance is dependent on other hard workers like yourself. I can raise 40% of my family's meat thanks to the hard work of the farmers who are making hay with big tractors and the farmers who are producing 
tons and tons of feed with their giant equipment so much work and you form a community as a modern day homesteader with these people you start to do business with them you get to know them on a first name basis when you get in trouble you can call up your hay guy and be like i got a problem with my cow what's wrong and he'll come by and take a look at her don't forget about the community and i don't want this to discourage you from doing as much as you can but my suggestion to you, Samco, is to do what we did, which is pick a couple things that you really are passionate about. We love livestock. You'll notice there's no garden here. I just love livestock. I don't wanna do the garden thing. It, it doesn't give me life. And uh, to quote another YouTuber. <laughs> so focus on the things you really enjoy, get really good at them, and then start to form that community with others and for income, find a way to make money that doesn't involve hours at a corporate job. Maybe find a way to work from home. Uh, you're a very ambitious couple, so if you're that ambitious, you can figure out a way to get paid while living from your beautiful homestead. Don't get paid for your time, get paid for your brain, get paid for your expertise. Find a way to leverage that and be able to create the life that you want. It's totally possible to live in a life where you love being on your homestead, surrounded by your family. That is not out of the grasp of reality. It took us about seven years to get to that point right now. It could take you guys even less if you're both working hard at it and not making the mistakes we made along the way. And that's why I'm being totally honest with you because I don't want you to make mistakes trying to do too much at once. Focus on a few good things, form that community, and find a way to make a living that allows you to be enjoying that homestead. Awesome question, and I, I want to hear updates. Keep us posted on your progress and uh, keep working towards it. As is usual with Ask Home Study, I talked way too much to get to all the questions that we had today. If your question hasn't been answered, make sure it was hashtag Ask Home Study so that I can find it. And I have a big list of questions I'm working through and I'm trying to get through. And maybe yours will be in next week's Ask Home Study episode. If you love what we do here on Home Study and you wanna make sure we can keep doing it, consider becoming a pioneer. Five bucks a month gets you access to bonus content, uh, discounts from homestead distributors like our buddy Dave at Northeast Edible who sells trees 10% off, apple trees, pear trees, whatever trees you want, he ships them. Fall is coming when you wanna plant your trees, so consider that. And uh, check out the classes and courses we have. There's a lot going on for the pioneers at thisishomesteady.com. And we will see you next week in our videos where we're going to be talking more about milking and working with the livestock, seeing more of the puppy. You'll be seeing some baby ducklings, which is always fun. Thanks for watching and we will see you soon. Trendsetter!